All right. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yeah? I hope everyone can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, can great. You, can you hear me? I can. Uh, looks like we have some people hopping in. Tom, I'm going to find your moderator <laughs> really quick. <laughs> we have a straight moderator. I'll be right back. Okay. Actually, actually, I'll just stay in here and we'll get this started and we'll get this uh, we'll get this thing hopping. Then we'll find your moderator. Give everybody buddy a few minutes to hop in here. Adjust my camera. And I'll make sure I've got the right slide deck. By the way, uh, Tom, bravo on the keynote and on your first presentation. Uh, Thank open you. core or open open source, monetizing open source. It was fantastic. I'm extremely excited about this one as well. I think this one's going to be fantastic. Yep, here's open. Uh, this is the this is you know this one an item. It's 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 plugin oriented programming pop uh, item. Those are the things uh, that I'm super super excited about this all comp, and I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping everybody else is as well. All right, yep, we should, so we, should, we should. Oh, it looks like we're we're getting some more people in here. Let's see what time is it. Yeah, we should probably get going here. Hey, everybody, welcome, welcome, one and all, to uh, to Tom's second presentation of Solcom next year. By the way, I'm very excited about this. We are actually going to devise a way to have Tom compete against himself. Presentation versus presentation here at Solcom. We, if we could give him more, we would. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I do think I ended up with probably one or two too many this year. Uh, maybe just a couple. Uh, anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started here. This is plug-in oriented programming. What the future looks like and why it's such a big deal. And uh, the man you're going to be listening to is one Thomas Hatch. He's the guy that created Salt. He's the founder of the Salt Project and the inventor of Item as well. So uh, and Pop. Let's not forget Pop. So uh, so here he is, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to turn it over to him, uh, Tom Hatch. All right, thanks, Chunga. I'll give a quick shout out to Chunga. He's done a fantastic job getting Solcom put together. Um, especially, we we had quite we had quite a few hiccups this year, uh, getting everything lined up. More than once, I had to remind someone uh, inside of VMware that uh, uh, normally we have a team. Uh, it, it reminds me of that scene in Ocean's Thirteen, when uh, when Basher is in the drill, and he says, "You know how many people, how many people manage this drill when?" When they were making the channel, teams, teams of people. I, I actually think I had that conversation with you a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite a few times. So, yeah. so big thanks to Chunga on everything that he's done. Now, you are here not to hear me talk about how, uh, how great a job Chunga has done, but you'd learn a little bit more about POP. Now, POP is plugin oriented programming. Now, I've been talking about uh, about pop for, uh, frankly, a few years now. Uh, we go back in time, and I started talking to people about pop. We introduced it at SaltConf 19 um, as uh, as a new open source tool. Uh, I uh, if I'm if I'm perfectly honest, we had a lot of distractions in 2020 a lot. Uh, some shared, some not shared. And um, a lot of pop development as well as item development, a lot of development on the things that we that we announced in 2019 um, got a little sidelined. Uh, the pandemic gave us a lot of, how do I put this, uh, social and economic distraction. And so I'm really excited to say that after the VMware acquisition, there was a renewed interest in some of these R&D projects. Uh, and we were able to come back and circle back around and refocus 
on some of these R&D projects. Uh, to be honest, we've, we've only really been able to round up um, really heavy resources for these projects in the last few months. And so I, I can't tell you how excited I am to one, see some of these things that I had started working on early on uh, be a, a few years ago, start to see the light of day again, one, but two, how much benefit, to be perfectly honest, having a bit of a cold spell has had for these projects. And when I see these projects, I really mean the pop ecosystem is just beginning to, to evolve in a big way uh, with projects like Item and Tiamat and Heist. Because what we're looking at here is that this kind of hiatus and realm of distraction that we had around a lot of the pop ecosystem over the last uh, over the last year year and a half has given us some breathing room to rethink some core constructs and some core structures and come up with uh, really I think uh, some good ideas uh, and it also gave us some breathing room to do a little more research and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that not just about plugin oriented programming in general. The main benefit of plugin-oriented programming is that this is a programming paradigm and style that allows for a code base to be externally augmented, meaning that other people can extend my code without my approval. Now, they extend my code, they maintain their own code, a user installs their dependencies, and that, that external piece they're able to extend a single code base in the same way that people are able to extend uh, libraries for something like the Python language. And through this app merging capability, that also means that it frees up developers and it frees up the people who are trying to drive those core software platforms and that they can focus on writing code, delivering features, and really continuing to develop that larger ecosystem. And so at the root of what POP is, what plugin-oriented programming is, is trying to introduce a new approach to solving the problem of scaling human beings. It seems as though we are constantly struggling with scaling people. And I think that we need to rethink the fundamental approach of how we scale the software development process. I feel that this is why, despite the fact that we have automated testing and DevOps utilities now, that um, our automated tests seem to take as long as the manual tests took 15 years ago, especially as projects get larger and the scale gets larger. And that our ability to commit code and drive change and progress has continued to become increasingly difficult because of the size and scale of applications. A couple of years ago, Microsoft came out with a, a research paper where they said that uh, they were able to chart the difficulty to maintain a piece of software directly relative to its overall size. And so as a piece of software got larger, you had an exponentially large number of people who needed who were needed to maintain that software and an exponentially larger amount of time for those people to contribute to the software and an ex exponentially smaller or inverse amount of code that individuals were able to contribute. POP is designed specifically to address that problem by asking the question of what has worked in the past and how can we create a software development model that makes it possible for us to scale large groups of people? What can we learn from open source software? What can we learn from highly distributed systems when we are able to look back and say that a certain system is able to deliver 
an end product, an end result with significantly less resources than other models. And how is it that we can reproduce this in a more reasonable and scalable way? And so the first thing that I wanted to do was look into the past. And I've got a picture of uh, the great genius, Dennis Ricci here. Um, and uh, really one of the most influential people in the history of computing. And I would argue that the, the reach of uh, the designs that uh, we received from, uh, from Dennis here are so incredibly influential that he's he's on he's on my uh, say my top 100 list of most influential people of the modern world. Um, but one of the things that he did that was so brilliant uh, is that uh, he created something which could evolve into the Unix philosophy. That idea that software components should be small reusable, repurposable, and that they create a larger stack. Now, me saying this today, in the world of software projects that sometimes are pushing billions of lines of code, billions of lines of code, it sounds ridiculous to think that we should be able to make compartmentalized code. But the most reused and successful software that is currently developed and distributed today is compartmentalized code and does still follow many of the core principles of the Unix philosophy. And so we need to be able to think about ways that we can continue to have human scale because there is no way that the available people in the world are going to be able to keep up with the overall software demands that currently exist. If we continue working on working using paradigms and models that require such a significant individual commitment, instead of allowing us to have rapid prototyping, rapid software development, easy, uh, uh, easy repurposing of software, easy rec recreation of componentry. If we aren't able to accomplish these things, then I feel quite strongly again that we're going to see software development slow down because of how difficult it is to maintain these monstrous code bases that we continue to build. And so the Unix philosophy is, is where I, I went back and gathered a lot of my core inspiration for what we're looking at here. But also what's happened to these sorts of projects when we have projects that are built around low level compartmentalization of code, then it allows us to rethink the large scale maintenance of software. It also allows us to rethink how the growth of that software is going to function in the long term. Because again, we're able to compartmentalize. So if we step back and think about the architecture of software, to fundamentally be compartmentalized, then we can create exponentially more reusable code. When we go back and we look at the early years of the object-oriented programming movement, and I'm a fan of object-oriented programming, I'm certainly not the person who's standing up saying, oh, we shouldn't do this. Uh, because I think that people in the past, for the most part, who have argued against object-oriented programming remind me of Plato arguing against writing. Uh, obviously, that paradigm was going somewhere. But I think that one of the things we've learned from object-oriented is that while it issues new ways to create code reuse, that the concepts around code reuse need to evolve so that we can look at code reuse in a much broader way. And that when we look at the architecture of software from a compartmentalization perspective, what we can gain is that we can create a software that's easier to build, easier to extend, easier to reuse, and is easier to make repurposed inside of larger software constructs. 
because the reality is that the way that we share code today is almost always overly purpose built for their applications. Code is too tied to its application needs. Instead of being able to look at code and say, we need to define a reusable pattern. And then we need to create a piece of software which is applicable to the reusable patterns that need to exist inside of our architecture. And then we can create a compartment that emphasizes a reusable pattern. And then inside of that reusable pattern, we should be able to expose almost immediately an entire extended software stack to drive new concepts. We shouldn't even need to discuss certain distributed computing patterns because we should already have all of the tools that we need to simply turn them on. But instead, we still go back to making monolithic platforms because it's because we have to rethink things on a fundamental layer to be able to compartmentalize our code in a way that makes it truly reusable. So I think that this approach would also allow us to create software where even these extremely complicated and distributed software stacks can dramatically simplify and also become safer, more efficient, and more cost effective and power effective and ecologically effective to run. And so what wisdom can we gain from the past? One of the things that fascinated me early on in my career and when I was in college was operating system design. Uh, that's probably not a surprise to people that I'm the kind of guy who has studied operating system design. When we go back and we look at uh, kernel development, kernel operating system kernel development was a uh, very popular, very exciting area of research in the 80s and 90s. This is primarily because uh, operating system kernels all of a sudden needed to be used for different things. In the past, it was all just mainframes, and you had a very specific, almost static way to express an operating system through, through a mainframe's utilization. But in the uh, 80s and 90s, we started to have desktops and we started to have virtual machines. Um, and so we started to talk a lot more about operating system design. And the design paradigm that a lot of people agreed would be the most efficient and wisest operating system design and kernel design was a microservice design um, and microkernels. And just got a great comment, uh, hoping microkernels become mainstream. And one of the things that made that design so fantastic was the compartmentalization of code. But what made that design difficult and impractical was that building microservice systems is a really hard thing to do. And that the reality is that Linux, for instance, is a monolithic design, but it's become much more compartmentalized and modularized over the years. It's moved as close to a microservice design as its core tenants allow it to. The other challenge that we run into is that when we design microkernels, there are so many different subjective mechanisms for intercommunication. And then we have to be able to lower the common denominator of intercommunication between microprocesses to a degree which is reliable and reproducible. And so we know that microkernel and microservice style deployments are good architecture. We know that that can drive excellent outcomes. But the question that I want to present is, is there a way that we can create fundamental low-level low systems that express a repurposable and consistent microservice design that can be more aggressively repurposed. And again, this is what POP is all about. Because POP creates a foundation for micro designs. 
Pop restructures code around making everything universal, universal pluggable interfaces. One of the big challenges that we run into in a microkernel design and a microservice design is that we end up saying that, yes, we've got a lot of micro services, um, but those individual services become monoliths in their own right. The argument that I'm going to present from a pop perspective is that I think that we need to have a way to structure code in such a way that it's easy to compartmentalize a layer below the service layer. When we compartmentalize a layer below the service layer, then those should naturally produce services by the very nature of how they're built. When you're able to naturally produce a service merely by writing compartmentalized code, then the intercommunication challenges go away and the pluggability of your software natively becomes ridiculously powerful. Pop does this by creating a concept called app merging. App merging inside of plugin-oriented programming means that any two applications can seamlessly merge together in either a horizontal or vertical fashion. That means that when we merge these two applications together, that they are following a consistent fundamental API exchange, that they both exist in a consistent shared hierarchical namespace, and that the way that they merge means that they don't need to necessarily be aware of each other inside, outside of their own developmental scope. This solves one of the primary problems that we run into in kernel design, because one of the fundamental problems that we have with kernel design is that you can't have kernel space and user space become all muddy and mixed. This is one of the main reasons why Linus Torvalds has banned people in the past from Linux kernel development. By having fundamental interfaces that are consistent and follow a simplified pattern, then we're able to universally absorb large amounts of code, we're able to compartmentalize work, and we're able to avoid single human bottlenecks of development. That means that we have to eliminate the barrier between app and library. This is how we think about code, though. We think about code, and oftentimes the first question that we ask is, is this an executable or is this a library? Plugin oriented programming eliminates that barrier, where we're able to say that virtually all code that you write has an a, uh, executable access point. And every executable that you write, because of plugin-oriented design, must be a library. So we no longer need to try and convince everyone to write libraries when they clearly are much more focused on writing applications, hence why we call it microservices, because we still think of it as independent applications. I feel very strongly that we need to break down that barrier from a low-level paradigm perspective. If there's anything that I've learned, it's that sitting down and, and creating a dogma or a philosophy and then telling everyone they must follow that philosophy, this doesn't work for people. It's very difficult for people, and it, and it, and it creates a point of friction. Instead, what works is when you simply say, oh, the design, the, the very mechanics of how something works drives its own progression. Then those mechanics can be used to create more machinery on top. Being able to get rid of bad practices through the mechanical design of software is massively beneficial to being able to drive a larger scale unified design. Next, we have the rules of pluggability, which I'm not actually going to go into in this, uh, in this presentation, but the rules of pluggability create code that is not just technically portable, but it's human portable. The rules of pluggability simply state that plugin-oriented programming creates its own compartments 
and its own scopes. In object-oriented programming, we say, well, we've got objects and we have methods and everything is an object. The challenge that I run into is that I don't feel that an object is a sufficiently flexible bag to contain all software constructs, that we need to have different bags of code that we can work with. And this is why POP has the constructs of plugins and the construct of subsystems and the constructs of what I call nano services and coroutines and the concepts of nested subsystems so that we're able to create hierarchical designs that mean that it's very easy to understand that the locality of our code is important to its relative functionality and that that locality defines that code's own scope of operation, but also the weight of its scope. And that through app merging, we're able to have different code bases that are able to be seamlessly merged together, meaning that we can develop inside of small compartmentalizable pieces and develop individual component tree and then merge it into larger scale applications by simply following very easy rules of pluggability. That mean, that goes on to my next point, which is again, the native, the native structure of the code enforces best practice. We do not beg a developer to follow best practice. We simply say, look, if you write code that makes sense in this paradigm, it will be best practice. And so POP therefore makes it easier to contribute to code and maintain larger code bases. And so I want to answer kind of what I feel is an elephant in the room question. And that is why is POP not more widely, more used more, more widely? POP has been around now for a couple of years. We announced it, like I said early on, at SaltConf 19. But there's a couple of reasons outside of the fact that POP is uh, was released and then we had a pandemic and uh, you know we, we've been kind of distracted as to why I think that we haven't gained a larger level of widespread use. And a lot of this is, to be honest, calculated. Um, so there's two sides to this coin. One is that I wanted to develop POP in such a way that I could continue to answer hard questions. I wanted to find out what would happen when we handed POP to people and they started developing with it and see how they reacted to POP as a paradigm. It's been very fascinating to me to see that where people have had the most problems with POP is the fact that the current implementation of POP is in Python. And it's nothing that's wrong with Python, but it's more along the fact that people look at it and they say, well, I still, I'm used to writing code in the Python way. And that mixing a new paradigm with an existing ecosystem presents lots of challenges on how we think about how that software needs to be developed. It's very difficult to sit down with somebody and say, uh, hey, uh, I want you to write a new paradigm. And uh, by the way, it uses Python. So you still have all the tools and mechanisms you're accustomed to. And some people have been able to get past that, but that's been definitely a barrier. And so I feel that for the paradigm to become more widely used, it needs to be expressed in new and some more flexible ways. But what's important is that the experiment, I feel, is proven. POP is currently being used in an increasing number of projects. Uh, POP is in significant amounts of enterprise software. POP is not only the foundation of the new item project, uh, and it's also one of the strong driving factors for item. But it's also at the core of TMI, SaltStack Config, which used to be uh, the SaltStack Enterprise uh, stack, um, and it's being used more and more inside of VRA. 
we're also beginning to see the pop paradigm primarily through incorporation of item into more enterprise software stacks inside of VMware. The fact that this programming paradigm is able to drive value inside of a company like VMware is one of the strongest ways in which I feel that this experiment is proven. And it's also one of the best ways that we've been able to refine the overall process of being able to come back and look at plugin oriented code and being able to always have that answer of, sure, I may have only written one interface, but it's still pluggable. Everything always natively becomes pluggable. One of the reasons that uh, I chose this picture for this slide, this is a picture of someone who is, uh, who I think is, again, one of the most influential people in modern science, but also someone who is often forgotten. Personally, I would put this man above Einstein because Einstein wouldn't be able to do what he did if it wasn't for uh, the genius of Michael Faraday. Uh, Michael Faraday is the one who, uh, basically figured out electromagnetic field theory, which is the foundation of basically all of modern physics. Um, and he was able to figure it out almost in a vacuum. I definitely feel that sometimes to make a big change, you have to begin to understand some of those scoped issues early on and then slog through difficulty until you get widespread adoption. The concepts around electromagnetic fields that Michael Faraday figured out in the 1820s and 30s weren't really incorporated for decades afterwards. Sure, he invented the electric motor, but there was so much more that needed to be figured out to get there. And so one of my hopes with, with POP is that we begun to prove the experiment but there are things that we still need to do to move that forward and to march on. Because the Python implementation of POP lives is fantastic, works very, very well, uh, is very stable, uh, and offers uh, really everything that you need to use the plugin oriented programming paradigm. But in the long run, I don't think that Python is going to be the best vessel for plugin oriented programming. Uh, I definitely feel that Python is an excellent vessel today, don't get me wrong. But I've been looking into a lot of different options on, well, let's just say different ways in which this paradigm can be expressed. And so some of this is that I'm beginning to look at and have been researching on whether or not it would be a good idea to go down what I've always thought is a rather crazy route. It would mandate that I grow a beard um, and build a programming language that expresses the paradigm. Because the reality is that there are limitations in even Python, which is one of the most flexible languages <laughs> ever. It's absolutely brilliant. I love Python. Um, but there are limitations in trying to express an entirely new programming paradigm without being able to extend or redefine some of the foundational concepts of a language. And so this isn't an announcement or anything, but I'm simply talking about the fact that one of my goals is to be able to better express plugin oriented programming. And so I've been spending some time lately researching what are the best ways to build a language that would be able to express plugin oriented programming. And there are surprise, not surprisingly, quite a few hurdles uh, that would need to be overcome to be able to define something that is able to have the necessary performance to still be a system programming language, but at the same time not be enveloped in system programming and be able to also be an app programming interface. And so that's something I hope to be able to have a prototype of someday. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what I'm spending my nights on from a research perspective these days. Now, the next thing that I wanted to do is walk through 
a little bit of pop code and explain how pop code works so that it's easier for folks to come back and look at things and say, ah, this is what he means by having a different software structure. And so I'll spend just a few minutes working on that and then we'll open things up to Q&A. And so I've opened up the item code base here. And so the item code base is, is a 100% pop project. And uh, you can get to the item code base by going to gitlab.com slash VMware slash item. And uh, actually, if we go up, I'm going to hop up a directory here. Uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize about uh, pop is that it means that we compartmentalize all of the code that we're developing, which means that uh, item itself is really just the runtime that we use for the new automation project. You can almost think about item as just similar to an extension of, or, or a different way of thinking about SALT's state runtime. And all of these different aspects of item can be merged and extended using entirely independent um, repositories and entirely independent projects and entirely independent um, tool chains. And so, for instance, we can come in and we can look at item VMC2, which is allowing us to build uh, VMC components uh, that can be managed using items, uh, items, paradigms, and constructs. And as we drive into them, we see that we've got execution modules and state modules. This is called vertical app merging. Vertical app merging means that we have a subsystem, which is defined in another project, and that we're going to add plugins to that subsystem from a separate project. And so you can maintain your entire plugin tool chain completely independently and then merge it into another project. There's also the concept of vertical app merging. Account here is a really good example. Account is used as a generic interface to gather credentials from multiple different systems and then present those credentials in a unified way. And so item does a horizontal app merge of account to merge in independent functionality as opposed to extensions of its own componentry. And so as we dive into item, uh, we will see that uh, we've got uh, quite a few things going on in the root directory. Most of these are things that you generally see in a root directory. Your setup.py used for Python packaging. Um, an item project still follows all of the rules, or sorry, a, a Python pop project still all, follows all of the rules of a Python project. They're still published to PyPy. Uh, we still build and distribute them using Python constructs. And even Tiamat, which uh, builds the single binaries and single distributables of uh, item and salt, uh, still follows uh, all of those core Python constructs. But as we dive into the uh, item Python package, we see that there are a couple of uh, Python files in here. We have the scripts.py, which uh, is basically to compensate for the fact that um, uh, we have to use setup tools and then we have to have an entry point into our code. This is also all of the code in Python that you need to write to bootstrap a pop environment. So we create the hub first. Uh, the hub in a pop project is the universal hierarchical namespace. Uh, that is used to be shared between uh, multiple uh, uh, multiple subsystems and plugins inside of a pop project. And then we add the dynamic name item. Dynamic names allow us to implement uh, subsystems. Subsystems are containers for more nested subsystems or plugins. 
And so we add a dynamic name to say that this new subsystem exists and can be dynamically extended by um, external interfaces. And then we call a function on the hub in the new subsystem, in a plugin in that subsystem, and then a function with a name inside of the subsystem. Plugin-oriented programming allows for object-oriented constructs, but is much more heavily in the functional and procedural realms, where we use many functional constructs and procedural constructs. And we think of object-oriented programming either to define what should be a low-level type and through the hub zone construct of presenting a hierarchical namespace. By presenting a hierarchical namespace, we feel that we satisfy many of the core tenets that are good and wise inside of object-oriented programming, particularly around things like um, encapsulation and code reuse. So we still follow object-oriented constructs, but they're encapsulated using a slightly different mechanism. And so if we go back here, we see that item presents a number of different subsystems. And so these plugin subsystems then present groups of plugins. And those groups of plugins express specific pieces of functionality. And so the item group of plugins is where items code resides. As you can see, we've got a number of plugins around the uh, foundation of items code that define how item, items state systems execute, how um, item resolves references to SLS data, um, and how items describe functionality works. But then we have subsystems nested inside of the item subsystem. And so those nested subsystems take lower level constructs. So for instance, here's where we have, where we expose the compiler's pattern. And this is something else that we, that we do inside of plugin oriented programming. We develop code that follows patterns. And those patterns, uh, there are many patterns that, uh, that have been developed thus far, but there are many other patterns, which I'm sure we'll come up with as time goes on. This uh, particular plugin subsystem follows a sequence pattern. A sequence pattern means that we're going to run these things in a sequence. I think it's probably pretty self-explanatory what's going to be run first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. But this sequence allows us to naturally and easily create plugins which intercept stages of that sequence and intercept stages uh, or run in between stages of that sequence because all of the data that we're working with in the sequence is shared across the plugins that are elements in said sequence. This means that it's easy inside of what is generally a complicated compilation process to say, maybe I want to run an additional step. And so we could simply add another stage in a new plugin, and you're going to immediately receive an additional um, step inside of this sequence pattern. This was particularly useful here because uh, the original implementation that I had for item had five stages. And it was easy to just tack one on the end, which adds um, a really interesting featured item called transparent requisites. <clears throat> Similarly, we can come in and take a look at a number of different subsystems that we have in here. So for instance, inside of salt and inside of the salt state engine, if we want to add a requisite to salt, it's a very, very complicated process because requisite resolution happens during runtime and is done by using a multi-forking recursive algorithm, which is a little difficult to follow. Um, I'm both proud of it and uh, it's not my favorite thing, if that makes sense. It's one of those where I said, well, that was terribly difficult to build. Um, and I think it's an impressive piece of engineering, 
but at the same time, I wish that it was broken up a little differently. Inside of item, a new requisite can be added simply by adding a plugin. And a requisite plugin is as simple as defining a function that returns a data structure. So item, instead of defining all of its requisite and dependency patterns in a difficult and static way, we define rules. And then those rules get picked up by the runtime. And it actually takes less physical code. There are more files, but less code. So we're able to define a rule that says, what are we going to do with a result? OK. Here we're able to have a rule that says result. OK, if I define a rule inside of a requisite called result, then I can tell it that the result either needs to be true, false, or none, and what, and what the condition is around the result. And bam, I have a requisite component. Similarly, we have something that is extremely complicated and difficult as the prereq component tree. And we can see that defining prereqs inside of item can be done in less than 30 lines of code. And so the challenge that we, or, or the benefit that we run into here is that the extension of the very engine can be done in a really, really simplistic way. All right. Now, I'm running out of time. I've given you a very brief overview of what uh, of what some pop code looks like. Um, and I'm going to now seed the stage and ask, uh, does anyone have any oops, questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals? All right. Uh, Reza has asked a question, uh, or two questions. Are there any use cases of pop on? Edge devices, IoT. If so, any hurdles for running item on edge devices? What language are you most excited for implementing pop in? I think you mentioned a few on the Hacks podcast, Zig. So the first question, pop is definitely intended for IoT design and management. Now, when we come to IoT man direct system management, uh, I would still probably encourage the use of SALT. SALT has a lot of additional tools that item doesn't have um, for system management, operating system management, et cetera. Item doesn't have those plugins. Item is capable of doing those things. And there was early on in item's design, I played with the idea of using it as a, as a replacement or a completely new alternative state system to SALT. Um, item is integrated into SALT and can be called from SALT. So, uh, there, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that if you wanted to do IoT design and IoT management, right now I generally, generally lean you towards using SALT as the mechanism that's communicating with the IoT device and, um, and using SALT's overall management paradigm. And that you would want to look at item as an additional extension component inside of it. Um, but that's for managing the device itself. Again, SALT is very, very good and very refined at managing devices. Um, but item is intended to manage uh, API interfaces. And so I do think that it would make a lot of sense to, um, uh, to manage item in an API interface sort of way. The next question is, if I'm going to try and make a language, a, a language for plugin-oriented programming, um, what language I, would I implement it in? I played around with this a lot. Um, I've went through and I've learned so many other languages and played with so many other languages over the last uh, few months that my head is kind of spinning. I love Zig. I think Zig is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think almost every language I've looked at is absolutely brilliant. Um, but to be perfectly honest, uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm is I'm going to implement uh, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to implement a transpiler um, in Python using pop. 
I kind of came to the conclusion that I think that uh, I should use the paradigm to build the paradigm. Um, and also because uh, once it's self-hosted, then that would be a paradigm that would be easy for uh, the new pop language to self-host. And so then uh, I'm going to make a pluggable transpiler. Um, and probably transpile to NIM first. I'm still not sure. Just because that would be easy. I mean, NIM's really, it's a really easy target. It actually gives you an incredibly rich uh, set, of, set of things to work with. Uh, the next question is, what background knowledge do I need to be able to read that item code? Just some Python knowledge. Um, uh, there is a pop uh, book that's out there um, that I wrote, ah, man, close to a little over a year ago. Um, and so the, uh, the pop book is, uh, is a really good read. You can probably consume it in an afternoon. It's very conceptual. It goes over a few examples um, and pops documentation. Uh, so it is, if you already know Python, it's really easy to come to speed. If you don't know Python, then learning Python's, I mean, talking about one of the easiest languages to get a handle on. The other thing about, about uh, uh, POP is that it still feels very Pythonic. And so definitely just take a few minutes, read up on the POP book um, and get a feel for things, learn how POP create works. Um, we did recently in, 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 in preparatory to announcing item in a bigger way at SaltConf and talk about POP a little bit more at SaltConf. We actually went through and cleaned a bunch of things up because we've formalized some constructs that are still a little nebulous. So the uh, next question is, uh, how many changes additions to POP do you foresee in the future? Um, so the Python implementation of POP, I don't see a whole lot of really core changes in the immediate future. I think that what we're going to see is that as we continue to play around with the paradigm, uh, we, we are going to probably see a few more core, core features. But And this is famous last words, right? Um, but I do think that a lot of those super core components, like how contracts work, how the hub works, I don't see paradigm, uh, big paradigm changes right now. I do think that we're going to see different ways to make it just easier to develop code using POP. Um, we've done work on things like uh, adding IDE support, and that's been really good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, from a from a lower level paradigm perspective, I don't I don't think we're going to see a lot of changes there. Um, so the next question is, how do you handle updates to plugins if you need to change? one product but other product is using the same plugin do you update all products using that plugin or create new plugin entirely um you definitely want to be able to pin versions uh when uh when you're updating plugins when you distribute a pop project uh, i would strongly encourage it to not use system python i uh, strongly encourage the use of tmi the original builds of tmi were specifically made to um, uh, to address pop projects, I wanted to be able to. Ironically, I want to be able to make something that's highly highly uh, distributable or uh, highly dynamic in nature, but also highly distributable, um, and that it would still use the static distribution model. And so, when you when you're creating uh, uh, products to use that plugin, one of the other things that's great. And then so kind of to take a different angle on that um, from a pop perspective, uh, you want to make sure that pop plugins are always really small and pop subsystems are small and pop projects are small. And so if you've got a large pop project, um, uh, if you've got a large pop project, you should be able, or at least the, the hope, and, what, and, and we've seen this, in general, is that the hope is that you've got a large pop project, but it's made of lots of small pop projects. And so an individual pop project should never be very big. And then when you've got a large distributable, it's really just a distribution of lots of smaller pop projects. And that that distribution, when it has a debug issue, you should almost always be able to 
pin that down to the project that is calling another project or the called project. And then you should be able to go directly to the upstream project um, and debug it in a localized environment. Um, and that, that I think is the optimal way to debug complex componentry anyway. Uh, because the super dynamic nature of it also means that the buck has to stop somewhere, that you've got to get to the end of the line to a certain extent. And that when you get to the end of the line, um, uh, you should be able to debug that process in an isolated fashion. Uh, because again, that's one of the things that I think is one of the major problems with extremely large scale and object oriented programming is that in object oriented programming, the, the, your dy the, the dynamism that you engage from a complexity perspective so often exists um, through things like aggressive polymorphism or inheritance constructs. And those are ridiculously difficult to do. Um, in that if, if you're just using things that have direct paths, then you should always be able to get to the end of the path. Plug-in oriented programming is all about pathing. And this is one of my core philosophies about building software in general, is that you need to be able to have um, an understanding as to what the path of your code is. All code must have a discernible, traceable path. And that path should exist through the complete implementation of that code and should be expressed in the physical nature of the code. And then when you have paths, you can easily chase down those issues. Okay, we are definitely out of time. Uh, although I think it's the networking hour next. Um, so I'm gonna say, does anybody have any final questions uh, or should I uh, or should I just let everybody go? All right, thanks Patrick. We're good, absolutely, yeah. Happy to run a little bit of interference for you. Everybody, we will be back um, after the networking hour uh, jumping into the banana problem here at the same place. Uh, well, a different session with a new link, but we'll be back again and uh, and ready to tackle any of the next things that come up. Tom is in basically every session period um, throughout SaltConf, so you'll you'll get more Tom if you want it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the original aspiration, but it did kind of end up that way. <laughs> okay, thanks, Patrick. Adios, everyone. Absolutely, thanks, everybody. <laughs>